Good afternoon. I'm sorry for the slight delay. Um, as you might imagine, with someone like uh, William Dalrymple, he's always busy, always moving. And I had a bit of a heart attack this morning when I learned uh, that he was delayed somewhere in transit between LA and here. And was and the, and the, and a, taken off the plane. Take, taken <laughs> off the plane, in fact, that's right. And the suggestion was made that maybe we could postpone this event to late in the afternoon or something like that. And I'm just like, oh my goodness, that's not going to happen. <laughs> um, anyway, thank you for coming and thank you for bearing with um, a 1210 start. As many of you probably know, this is how we do things here at Berkeley. Um, so we call you in at 12 and then we start a little later. Um, good afternoon. My name is Munis Faruqi and I'm in the Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies. I must start today by thanking all the organizations and institutions that have made possible for us um, this opportunity to welcome William Dalrymple to campus. They include, bear with me for a second, it's a long, long list, the Center for South Asia Studies, the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, the Center for British Studies, the Institute for International Studies, the Department of Near Eastern Studies, the Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies, the Department of History, and the Department of English. I've been struggling over the past few days to figure out how exactly to introduce William Dalrymple. The truth of the matter is that he is one slippery character. Is he a radio personality? A documentary film producer? A curator? A journalist? A travel writer? a historian, a political commentator, or a literary critic. The truth of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, that Mr. Dalrymple is all of the above and more. In a world of professionalized tracks and specialized skills, here is a man who truly defies easy characterization. He is that rare breed of individual who, by all appearances, easily floats between different media between different writing genres, between academic and non-academic worlds, between geographic locations. As many of you here are aware, William Dalrymple has written a number of award-winning and best-selling books, including The City of Jinns, The White Mohuls, and The Last Mohul. In my remaining time, however, I want to draw your attention to a special skill set that defines Mr. Dalrymple for me. You see, I know of almost no one else who is more generous with his time, friendship, and commitment to encouraging conversations between different people from different milieus. Nowhere is Mr. Dalrymple's generosity of spirit and intellect more apparent than in his role as a co-organizer of the Jaipur Literature Festival in India. For those of you who have never heard of it, it is the largest literary festival in the world drawing almost 200,000 attendees in 2012. Beyond size, what is remarkable about this festival is that it not only accommodates some of the most famous literary figures in the world, but also puts them on the same dais as folk storytellers, Dalits, Bahujan, and tribal literateurs, and a whole host of other marginal voices. Most significantly, attendance is totally free. It is his time and effort for such events that mark William Dalrymple, to my mind, as a world-class intellectual, literateur, and patron. If there is an unwritten rule of being a historian, which is what I am, it is that we never, never, ever make predictions. I'm going to break that rule today. It is precisely because of the capaciousness of his spirit and intellect that I believe that Mr. Dalrymple is going to be knighted by the Queen, or maybe, maybe, just maybe, a King of England in the coming years. Okay, folks, when it happens, you heard it here first. <laughs> it's happening. It's happening. Um, William Dalrymple is with us today to read from his latest book, The Return of a King, The Battle for Afghanistan, 1839 to 42. Besides lots of favorable reviews, it is already being touted as a contender for a number of Best Book of the Year awards. Following the reading, which I think will last about 45 to 50 minutes, we will have a brief Q&A to be followed by a book signing. On that note, please join me in welcoming William Dalrymple to UC Berkeley. Thank 
thank you very much for that over-the-top um, introduction. I'd like you all to refocus from this lovely, warm, springtime campus uh, to a bleak spot on the step between Iran and Afghanistan on a summer's night in 18... 37. And a lone horseman is riding up this road, uh, and as he rides, you can see him nodding off. This guy's been on his horse, he's ridden from Kirmanshah in the far west of the country. He's been on his horse for two days and a night, and this is now the second night. And as you watch him, you can see this character fall forward, perhaps in his saddle, um, and at any rate, he wakes up after a nap of some sort on his saddle and he's lost the road. He's somewhere out in this dodgy area. Even today, the area between Meshed and Herat is not the kind of spot you want to get lost or have a breakdown. Uh, it is um, what we in Scotland call debatable land uh, between two um, rival uh, powers. And at this particular moment, it's a particularly bad moment to get lost because there's a, um, two rival armies about to break into war either side of the frontier. The reason this horseman, a young British um, artillery officer who's also a spy, who's also an Orientalist, Henry Rawlinson in years to come will be remembered for translating cuneiform. And any of you, um, the, the, I know the Cyrus Cylinder is currently touring the States. It, well, it's, it's in um, the Freer Sackler in D.C. at the moment and is moving to the Getty next month. He's the guy that deciphered that later on in his life. But at this stage, he's a young 27-year-old officer and he's moving up to, uh, to Meshed because the newly crowned Shah of Iran, Mohammed II Qajar, is about to fulfill his coronation promise to seize back for Iran the, what it regards as the lost border city of Herat. And Muhammad II has promised in his coronation speech that this is what he will do. So he's amassed, within three or four months of coming to the throne, the entire Persian army, and it's camped outside Meshed, and it's about to cross the border and try and take back Herat. Rawlinson is lost. It's the middle of the night. He has no idea where the road is. So he wanders around in the dark for a while, trying to find his way. And then, with great relief, he notes dawn beginning to come and um, light filtering on the slopes of the Kohi Shah Jahan mountains around him. Uh, and just as it's getting light, and he's beginning to feel a sense of relief that he uh, can find his way now back to the road, he sees what he would least wants to see coming towards him. A large dust cloud resolves itself into a large body of horsemen heading directly down a valley towards him. So he does what any one of us would probably do in this circumstance if you're lost in a rather dodgy area in between two warring armies and a whole huge body of cavalry bearing down on you. He makes himself as scant as he can. He goes off into a little side valley, uh, gets off his horse with his groom uh, and waits for these horsemen to pass. And he imagines it's either going to be opium smugglers or brigands or the Persians coming to, uh, uh, to uh, Herat or the Her Heratis going to Meshed, but it's none of those. What he sees in the next five minutes changes the history of Central Asia for 100 years. It radically changes what happens next for this whole region. So what he sees, well, actually before we tell you what he sees, uh, let's go back a bit, let's give some context. So this is... 1837. It is 20-odd years after Waterloo. The French have been knocked out of the competition which has already begun between different European powers uh, to gobble up profitable chunks of Asia. Um, two powers are left in play after Waterloo. The British, represented strangely and oddly enough not by the British government, one of the strange quirks of South Asian history that we don't often dwell on the strangeness of it because it's written so much into our uh, sort of uh, 
into the frame of South Asian history now, but the strange and very odd circumstance that South Asia is conquered by a public limited company. The East India Company has a boardroom, it has shares, it has shareholders, it has annual general meetings. Unlike most other companies, it also has the largest standing army in Asia. And in 50 years, the East India Company has expanded out from its ports of Bombay, Madras, Calcutta, and has gobbled up more of India than Napoleon conquered of Europe. There's no modern equivalent to the East India Company, thank God. Uh, I mean, we'd, we'd be talking sort of Microsoft with armies or PepsiCo with fighter jets or something. To, uh, and I think it's very important to realize what a strange creature to, to, to keep a sense of surprise and, and perhaps anger or even fear at the, at the, at the existence of this this terrible hybrid, a company which is also an empire. Um, think Blackwater times a million or something. G4 security, I don't know, anyway. Um, so at the same time as all this is going on, and the British have got as far as Ludhiana by 1837, and Punjab within sight of the Himalayas, looking onto the, um, onto the Hindu Kush and, and Peshawar, and, uh, within, almost within sight, uh, they're at the banks of the Sutlej. At the same time as all this is happening, southwards, the Russian Empire is expanding in, equally, in an equally aggressive and uh, equally voracious fashion. Since Peter the Great, the uh, Russian Empire has moved southwards at a rate of around uh, 100 miles every decade. And it's now at the Orenburg Line, poised onto the, uh, looking on the great caravan cities of Tashkent, Bukhara, Kiva, and so on. And, um, any old buffer sitting in a club in Pall Mall in London, or any Russian officer in his officer's mess in St. Petersburg, looking at the map, can see that these two empires are spreading rapidly towards each other. At some point, they're going to bump up against each other in the Ammark space in the middle that we today call Afghanistan. Uh, and particularly on the British side, there's a whole raft of polemic being produced. Um, arguing that the British should mu have a forward policy, as it's called, which means moving forward at double speed into the Himalayas, into sort of jumping over the Sikh kingdom of the Khalsa, which lies in between, and somehow grabbing um, the valleys of Afghanistan, the Hindu Kush. Uh, the argument goes, if you grab this, you control the routes between Persia and China, between Samarkand and Delhi, High Asia will be yours, say the Plemicists, these kind of Victorian equivalents of Daniel Pipes or Neil Ferguson, uh, churning out this sort of uh, pro-empire polemic. But in reality, there's still several thousand miles separating them. And not even the Plemicists can pretend this is an imminent danger that the Russians are going to be in, because they are, there's, there's, there's about five or six emirates separating them from Afghanistan. Uh, so it's all a bit pie in the sky. Um, this doesn't stop someone called Arthur de Lacy Evans producing um, a, 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 these alarmist Russophobic tracks saying that in six weeks a Russian army can appear at Herat, two more weeks it'll be marching through uh, Lahore and, and, and uh, the jewel in our crown will be lost. And this sort of stuff is, as, as Ferguson's books were, is widely disseminated and sent off the uh, Lord Ellenborough, who is the uh, Minister of State in the Cabinet who oversees the East India Company, reads it in his study one Sunday night, and by morning he sent off six copies to the Duke of Wellington, the Prime Minister, and another to the Governor General in India, uh, and must read this. Terribly important. You know. um, crazy stuff if you read it, but still. But why this is important is that what Rawlinson sees in his valley is not opium smugglers, brigands, Persians, or Afghans. It is to his surprise, but presumably enormous excitement, a large body of Russian imperial Cossack horse heading from the direction of Tehran, heading into Afghanistan. And he only sees this because these guys are not traveling by the road. They've gone sneakily down a, a little uh, uh, valley uh, away from the main road. Um, he only sees this because he happened to have fallen asleep in the saddle and got lost. And he realized immediately the value of what he'd seen. It is, to an intelligence officer of the uh, early 19th century, the equivalent of say, finding the weapons of mass destruction, or uh, perhaps more accurately, it's the yellow cake. Because this single nugget of information is then seized on and manipulated and played with and exaggerated by an ideologically driven group.
group of hawks to create a war that they already want to fight. Uh, uh, what, uh, what the way that the neocons manipulated 9-11 uh, so as to bring about an invasion of Iraq that they'd already formulated in their think tanks uh, many years earlier is a direct parallel to what happens at this point. Um, and um, the rhetoric is astonishingly similar in both cases. Here's the British ambassador in Tehran, John McNeil. We should declare that he who is not with us is against us. We must secure Afghanistan. Um, you remember all those debates in the kind of you know, New York Times and so on about the duties of an occupying power. Should we go there just out of pragmatism or should we be there to liberate the women of Afghanistan, to help them burn their burqas and stop honor killings? This is the Victorian version of this. Here is Sir Claude Wade writing to her, the Governor General in the eve of the 1839 invasion, warning in a kind of Rumsfeldian manner that there is nothing more to be dreaded or guarded against, I think, than the overweening confidence with which we are too often accustomed to regard the excellence of our own institutions and the anxiety that we display to introduce them in new and untried soils. Such interference will always lead to acrimonious disputes, if not a violent reaction. Nonetheless, for all this, a plan is made. Next slide. So this character is the prize asset in the quiver of the British intelligence chiefs in Ludhiana and Calcutta. This is Shah Shuja Ulmulk, the king of the title of this book, Return of a King, who is the grandson of Ahmed Shah Durrani, the great Afghan leader who defeated the Marathas at Panipat, who created a short-lived empire that filled in the vacuum of the northern half of the Mughal Empire, the Uzbek, southern half of the Uzbek Empire, the eastern half of the Safavid Empire. And the uh, Amir Shah Durrani's brief-lived Durrani Empire fills modern Afghanistan, modern Pakistan, eastern Iran, Kashmir, and northern India as far as Delhi. But by the time his grandson has come to power, only 40 years later, in 1800, the empire is already creaking to a collapse. It's a kind of like a, like a mushroom. It appeared suddenly overnight and it's declining with equal speed. And poor old Shah Shuja, who's a very different figure from his grandfather, his grandfather was this sort of extraordinary warlord, uh, a deeply unpleasant looking man. He had an ulcer that ate away his nose and he fitted a silver nose in its place and went around with like some sort of figure from a, from a science fiction movie or something with a kind of half metal face. Um, defeating all anything said against him. But Shah Shuja, as so often is the way with grandsons of sort of doughty warlords, is an intellectual and like, prefers to write couplets and poetry and sit at home studying <laughs> Babo, the Babo Nama, writes his own little autobiography in the manner of the Babo Nama, uh, and is crap at fighting. <laughs> and, and, and all his life, he loses every battle that he ever fights. He's incredibly unlucky and incredibly civilized. So I just borrow the book. There's a, a lovely dedicatory passage in which he opens his autobiography. Great kings have always recorded the events of their reigns, some writing themselves with their natural gifts, but most entrusting the writing to historians and writers, so that these compositions would remain as a memorial on the pages of passing time. Thus it occurred to this humble petitioner at the court of the merciful God, Shah Shuja Ulmulk Shah Durrani, to record the battles and events of his reign, so that historians of Khorasan should know a true account of these events, and thoughtful readers take heed from these examples. <laughs> so Shah Shuja um, inherits the throne at the striking age of 13 and loses it by the age of 21. And <clears throat> shortly after, uh, his wife managed, goes to Ranjit Singh in Lahore and strikes a deal. Her husband is languishing in a prison cell in Kashmir. If Ranjit Singh invades Kashmir and liberates her husband, she will give Ranjit Singh the most precious thing they still possess, which is the Koh i -Noor. And unbeknown to her husband, she fixes this deal. This extraordinary woman, Wafa Begum, who is one of the many strong, independent-minded Afghan women in this book, and in the story, who they exist uh, strikingly at this time. Uh, these matriarchal 
um, Afghan uh, uh, women leaders from the main families, particularly the Barakzais and the Sadrasai dynasties. And Rajat Singh does exactly this. Shah Shuja is, is sprung from his jail in Kashmir and the Kohinoor is handed over to Ranjit Singh and poor old Shah Shuja goes off penniless into exile in British East India Company uh, territories. There's a scuffle at the border because no one wants to take responsibility in a typical bureaucratic, bureaucratic way for letting him in. But eventually, um, uh, Sir David Dr. Loney takes responsibility and writes this rather chivalrous letter saying that his queen is waiting at the border, this woman who has suffered so much, and he takes responsibility, he buys her her belly with his own money and establishes them uh, in Ludhiana. And there they remain for 30 years. Now, with this project, uh, this forward policy project to take Afghanistan with the backing of all the establishment in London because the Russians had thought to be coming imminently to come and seize Afghanistan. In fact, the reality is that this little expedition, next slide, led by this man, Ivan Vitkovich, was only a tentative exploratory project to unofficial, without official documents from the Tsar to see whether it is possible or not to open diplomatic relations with Dost Mohammed. So it's a very tentative affair. It certainly wasn't a precursor to a, a major Russian invasion of India, which is how it gets inflated by the time that the uh, Sir Claude Wade and his other intelligence officials have got their hands on this bit of information. Um, but uh, the plan is, next slide, that Dost Mohammed, who's the ruler in the middle here, the ruling emir of Kabul, uh, will be replaced. There will be, in modern parlance, regime change. The Shah Shuja will be taken out of retirement in Ludhiana and shoved back on the throne. And the idea, first idea, plan A, is the person who will do this is, uh, is Ranjit Singh. Uh, and Ranjit Singh, uh, seen here on his elephant, um, s s surrounded rather bizarrely by Jain monks, which I rather, rather love about, and a sadhu, um, mm -hmm. as well as lots of Sikhs in Lahore. Um, Ranjit Singh is going to go and invade Afghanistan for the British. They've already been skirmishing. Ranjit Singh has captured... Ranjit Singh's entire empire is built out of the ruins of the Durrani Empire. He is first appointed to the position uh, of governor of Lahore by Shah Shuja's elder brother. <coughs> um, and after he helps him rescue some cannons who got, which got stuck in the jellum and in the mud of the jellum. And since then, he's carved out this entire territory uh, in the Punjab uh, out of the old Durrani Empire. And the, his last conquest is Peshawar, which the Durranis particularly dislike because this is their summer capital. Uh, and they're determined to get it back. So the idea is Ranjit Singh will go and invade Afghanistan for it. Sadly for the British, they put the negotiations uh, in the hands of a complete idiot called Sir William McNaughton. Paul McNaughton should never have left the, company, the secretary's office, writes his deputy. He's ignorant of men, even to simplicity, and utterly incapable of forming and guiding administrative measures. The judicial line would probably have suited him best, and even then only the Court of Appeal judging only written evidence. Uh, so just the man you want to lead your expedition into. This is the, this is the, the Richard Horowitz. Is it, what's it called? The, uh, Richard, uh, yes, uh, Richard Holbrook. This is the Richard Holbrook of his day. Uh, Richard Holbrook, who was described to me by the British High Commissioner in Afghanistan, Sh Sharon Cooper Coles, as a bull who brings his own china shop wherever he goes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, McNaughton goes into negotiation with Ranjit Singh to try and persuade him to invade Afghanistan for him. And, and Ranjit Singh is a fabulously wily old character. He gets the British drunk, he, he pulls all these tricks. At the end of it, it becomes a British expedition in, in Sikh interests rather than the other, which is meant to, rather than a, a Sikh expedition in British interests. And as a final coup de grace, Ranjit Singh, the week before they set off, actually bans the British from crossing the Punjab at all. Uh, and they have to go in this enormous dog's leg down into Baluchistan, then up, the, up through the Kojak and Bolan passes, uh, and. Uh, um, it's about triple the length of the invasion route had they just gone up to Peshawar uh, and up the Khyber. Um, so, so game to Ranjit Singh so far. Um, he promises a, a large army of, of uh, Punjabi Muslims to support the invasion who never mysteriously turn up. Um, so, but lots of other people do turn up. The force which is gathered in the plains of Ferozpur, recorded in this fabulous Victorian strip cartoon, um, consists of 14,000 East India Company sepoys, 6,000 irregulars, 21,000 troops in all. 
accompanied by 38,000 Indian camp followers. They march off to war in th with 30,000 camels. One brigadier needs 50 camels to carry his uniforms, while the ranking British general needs 260. One uh, regiment brings its own pack of foxhounds uh, for entertainment <laughs> or route. 300 camels carry nothing other than the regimental wine cellar. 30 camels carry cheroots and cigars, and one camel goes all the way to Afghanistan carrying nothing but eau de cologne. <laughs> Um, the only thing they haven't got is a map. They have absolutely no idea where they're going. Next slide. <laughs> Off they go, through the desert of Bluetooth Star, and these poor sepoys dropping like flies. They don't know where the water is. Uh, no one's brought, no one's sort of, they're in their winter uniforms, this thick red fustian, they're in Baluchi, the Baluchi Desert, at Mulk, crossing through um, Shikarpur and these uh, broiling deserts at the middle of summer. And these, uh, I mean, it's get desperate. Uh, they lose a quarter of the army through mismanagement without a single shot being fired. Next slide. Into the Kojak. Uh, anyone here ever been on the railway line between Quetta and Lahore? Yeah, you pass up that. Uh, today it's the railway cutting. Exactly. Uh, this is the route they choose, which is also, of course, the route today that the Taliban uh, use to go from Quetta into the back end of Afghanistan. From there, they go up the Bolan Pass. Next slide. And as I say, they've got no map because there is no map. So, I mean, you can just see this little sort of conversation here. You know, where's Afghanistan? Also, just, just go straight. Just go. <laughs> We've all had those. <laughs> just, just go straight. No problem. <laughs> and uh, as a result, this sort of complete ragged mess of an army uh, of debouches out the back end of the Kojak Pass, maybe a quarter of the size it was when it set off. But such is their amazement. When they, um, when they emerge from the uh, Kojak Pass into the dust, the meadows around Helmand, the, the rulers of Kandahar flee. And next slide, and they capture Kandahar without a shot being fired, and Shah Shuja can go to his uh, grandfather's mausoleum, which is a very similar building to um, Shah Shah Shuri's tomb at Sasaram. It's one of these lovely octagonal um, tombs with a uh, Mughal in, in style, uh, but with a dome more like uh, Saftajan's tomb, this nice sort of uh, late Mughal onion dome. Uh, and he goes there and he pays respects at his grandfather's grave and then he puts on the cloak of the Prophet, uh, and, uh, which is what, of course, Mullah Omar did in 2001 and declared himself Amir al-Mumini, the leader of the faithful. So. Um, British intelligence then intervenes. As we know, British intelligence is cutting edge and never gets anything wrong. Um, this ragged force has pulled an enormous park of artillery all the way up the Kolak, Kojak and Bolan passes. They've had to take the barrels off and, and get rid of the uh, chassis and you know, pull teams of sepoys hauling these things up mountainsides and back. And have you seen that wonderful opening of um, in that Herzog film, Aguirre, Wrath of God, where the, the conquistadors are carrying those cannons up Machu Picchu? It's that sort of scene. Um, and so when British intelligence intervenes and announces that Ghazni has no walls, everyone's very pleased. They leave the artillery behind in Kandahar and go off just on foot only to discover, next slide, that uh, Ghazni does indeed have rather good walls, next slide, in fact, has the greatest walls in Central Asia, and they haven't got a single cannon, so they're stuck. Uh, luckily, some gallant chap volunteers to roll a barrel of gunpowder up at the front door and then light it, and this is literally what happens. They roll the barrel of gunpowder at the front door of the fort, they have a faint attack at the back, so all the Afghans go running around the back, and they blow up the front door, and in they march. And this is the one serious action on the way in. And having got that, everyone uh, runs off. Dost Muhammad picks up all his wives and treasure, sets off for Bukhara over the Hindu Kush. And Shah Shuja is replaced in the Bala Hisar of Kabul. Next slide. Uh, he left it at the age of 21. He's now 51. Uh, but he's back on the throne after three fail failed attempts. Um, and everyone all the hawks are triumphant, rather like Wolfowitz preening himself in December 2001. Everyone said you won't be able to take Afghanistan and it falls instantly. Uh, so um, McNaughton uh, finds that this, this far-flung project of um, conquering Afghanistan, amazingly, and despite the worst preparations imaginable and the lack of intelligence at every stage, um, 
that he has actually conquered Afghanistan and made all the more sweet when he finds that his Russian rivals have tried to take Kiva and got caught in a blizzard and only three men have made it back on that expedition. Um, and in the smugness of this warm glow of self-satisfaction that they feel at this point are sown the seeds of all the catastrophes to come because they don't bother going up to the Balahisar on the top left of this picture uh, or even uh, fortifying themselves in any way. They simply, astonishingly, just lay out their tents in the Kabul Valley floor. And as you can see from this picture, it's surrounded on all sides by hills. This is the Bimaru Hill, which is still there, and the airport road, no Kabul, runs this way. The airport's here. Um, and they, in time, put up a little palisade and dig a ditch. But it's basically, it's a cantonment. It basically has a fence around it. Uh, it's not a fortress, and it's completely indefensible in the event of any sort of trouble. Meanwhile, the Memsabs are marched up from Simla. Lady Sale arrives with her grand piano. Um, absolutely amazing how she possibly could have got a grand piano, but she does. With the grand piano, her unmarried daughter, and lots of seeds from her kitchen garden in Agra. And the following spring, she's writing in her diary, my sweet peas and geraniums were much admired, and in the kitchen garden, the potatoes especially thrive. And there's cricket and horse racing and open-air amateur theatricals, and as winter draws in, snipe and duck shooting and snowman building, the foxhounds are taken out to hunt foxes. Alexander Burns, the rather oversexed British Governor General, Deputy Governor General, uh, has, throws a Christmas party with his Highland dress with kilt and an enormous sporran. And already there's talk of dis discreet talk of annexing Afghanistan to the company territories and moving the summer capital from Simla to Kabul. And so to do it, to do to emulate the Mughals in that way, who Babur, of course, is buried in in Babur's garden just outside Kabul. Um, but it all begins to go wrong, and what happens is what every occupying power in Afghanistan finds. It's perfectly easy to walk in, but it's very expensive to occupy Afghanistan. Now, if you were to do something like invade Iraq, not that anyone would dream of doing anything like that, you could just run off with oil revenues. Uh, but in this case, there is nothing, as Dost Mohammed says, there's nothing in Afghanistan save stones and men. Uh, and this is something that Shah Shuja picks up in his correspondence. Shah Shuja, writing for more arms, says that Ka Ka Afghanistan has never paid for its own garrisons. Uh, we've always uh, extracted the money to pay for our defense from tributary regions like Sindh and Kashmir, rich regions that we can tax. We've never paid for our own things. So it's not a surprise, he said, that you have to spend some money to garrison. Uh, but the accountants won't have it. A, this is not a good moment for the opium trade. The British, who originally came to India to buy spices and, and textiles, survive these days by growing opium in Bihar and Bengal, selling it to the Chinese, buying tea in, in the treaty ports, and selling that in London. So it's a triangular trade, but it's quite a fragile little profit. By the time that you've got the whole Indian army paid for, there's not much left over. Uh, and the conquest of Afghanistan puts it immediately in the red. So what do they do? The accountants complain that they haven't got the resources, so they come up with a clever scheme. We'll train up an Afghan national army. Then we can leave our puppet in place, uh, and we can march out again, and everyone will be happy. <laughs> And uh, again, it could never happen today. And um, this is what they do. But in order to pay for the Afghan National Army, they had to start confiscating estates from the old nobility, uh, the Mansab system, uh, the, old, the old Mughal system, where you give someone an estate in return for cavalry if, if he doesn't have to provide the cavalry because you want a nice permanent sepoy army, infantry army, rather than a dodgy feudal cavalry army. Um, and so they start confiscating states, and this begins to irritate the nobility, who up to this point have been perfectly happy to go hunting with the Brits and take Shah Shuja rather than Dos Mohammed. Dos Mohammed had ruled very effectively and firmly, which Shah Shuja never does. So this is the beginning of irritation. Then, of course, you, I don't know how many of you have wandered around any provincial English town on a Friday night with hundreds of these young guys spilling out of pubs, being sick everywhere. This, so this sort of thing is going on in Kabul. There's lots of young squaddies drinking too much. There's 300 camels full of... Uh, claret have, have, uh, have multiplied, 
and there's lots of Indians sort of spitting beetle all over the place and making a nuisance of themselves too. Uh, and the Afghans hate it. They don't like these occupying troops. Uh, the mullahs start preaching against the immorality because the British quickly turned Kabul into an enormous brothel. There are 30,000 single men sitting in the cantonment, and Afghan women are going in in burqas and in sort of first as a trickle, then a kind of great flood of them, and coming back richer the following morning. So there's a kind of mass cuckolding of the men of Kabul. And then further cuts are demanded. We have to cut the costs. So they break the arrangements that they make with the, with the frontier tribes. McNaughton has signed several uh, memos of understanding with the Gilzai and with the Afridis in, in the Khyber and the other passes that they will keep the road open. This is called the Radari system. You pay just road tax. And uh, Aurangzeb pays it in, uh, in the 1700s uh, when he's chasing uh, Kushal Khan Katak around in, in this region. And um, Nadir Shah pays it, in both going into Delhi to loot the Mughals and, and take the Peacock throne and the koh -Nor. And he pays it again on the way back. And this is just a system. There was a bit of imperial British dog rule. I can't remember how it goes, something along the lines of uh, you, you um, beat the Baluchis and thrash the Sindhis, but you pay the Patans. Uh, and, just, just <laughs> and again, no one would think of doing that today. <laughs> Bundles of dollar bills being handed off by the CIA to strange rulers. It just, you know, unimaginable. But, but, but this is what the British start doing and then stop doing. And in stopping doing it, and cancelling these, effectively these contracts with the frontier tribes, immediately the frontier tribes close the roads. The duck stops that day, and any merchant trying to cross gets his throat cut, isolating the garrison in Kabul and cutting it off from the other two garrisons, which are in Jalalabad and in Kandahar, smaller garrisons. And then finally, next, uh, next, uh, Dost Muhammad surrenders, but nonetheless, next night it all goes wrong when Alexander Burns starts seducing the girlfriends of some of the leading noblemen. And this girl is the girlfriend of Abdullah Khan Achakzai. He, this is a mistake. He's one of the leading nobles at the fort and he's not going to take it lightly. This is an account by Mirza Atta. Um, one of the best of the diary accounts uh, of the British occupation at this time. Uh, An extraordinary account called Nilwe Ma'arak. He starts off as a sympathizer of Shah Shuja and ends up as a, uh, as a firm opponent. Uh, no, uh, Mirza Atta puts a rather wonderful speech in Abdullah Khan Achakzai's mouth. Now we are justified in throwing off this English yoke. They stretch the hand of tyranny to dishonor private citizens, great and small. Making love to a slave girl isn't worth the ritual bath that has to follow it. But we must put a stop right here, right now. Otherwise, and this is my favorite phrase egg in the whole book, otherwise these English will ride the donkey of their desires into the field of stupidity. <laughs> Don't we all in our different ways? Anyway, to the point of having us all arrested short, uh, I put my trust in God and raise the battle standard. The other Sadars, his childhood friends, tightened their belts and girt their loins and prepared for jihad. And so, Abdullah Khan Achakzai, it's not a planned event. It's not like 1857 where you have sort of months of messages going around the different regiments and sort of japatis and lotus flowers and all the rest of it with lots of rumors. This is sparked off by this single man going and trying to, trying to get his honor back. He turns up with his mates outside Burns's residence, one early morning and the girls inside. Sort of thing I'm sure happens in Berkeley every week, but rather than just throwing <laughs> stones through the windows, um, he burns the place down. And then when Burns runs out the back next side, um, he cuts him to shreds, kicks his ha head around like a football for a few days, and then hangs up the body, the trunk, on a meat hook in the bazaar. Um, next slide. His boss, Burns's boss, Sir Henry McNaughton, goes out to negotiate in his top hat and blue tinted spectacles, as one does, uh, and is shot dead by the Afghan negotiating team. <laughs> William, oh, that's right, go back to him again. William Elphinstone, the leading general, uh, who is this gout ridden old fool who hasn't fought since Waterloo, gets onto his horse, falls off his horse, the horse falls on him, and that's the end of Elphinstone. <laughs> um, next slide. Uh, back one, uh, back from Melfordson. Uh, and then the British very intelligently have put all their ammunition and all their food 
in two outlying forts between the cantonment and the city. They haven't actually bothered to bring their ammunition or their food within the um, cantonment. So the, the Afghans loot that within the first 48 hours of the uprising. And within a week, they're pulling captured British cannons onto the hills, the Bimaru Hill above the cantonments, and simply shelling. And as you can see, it's completely indefensible. It's still lines of tents just out in a, out in a, in a valley. Um, there's a few barrack blocks which have sprung up in the previous 18 months. Uh, there's some substantial buildings over here, but basically it's, it's lines of tents. And it's surrounded by woods and irrigation channels. It, it's a kind of gorilla's dream. Uh, anyone can, can crawl up and have a pot shot. Uh, and anyone can fire a cannon into it. So it's a completely indefensible position. There's no help coming because this is now November. The, po close, the passes are closed for the winter. Um, no reinforcements coming from India because the Khyber's blocked. You can't get through that way. And they eat their fox hands, and then they eat their horses, and then they're screwed, and they surrender. Um, and next slide, and next after that, and all they can do is pack up and go for home. And they're given free passage by the rulers, by the, the leader of the rebellion, uh, uh, Wazir Akbar Khan, uh, through the passes, and they're allowed to march out with their arms, which they do on the 6th of January, 1842. Four and a half thousand troops are all that are left after the troop cuts. Of them, only 700 Europeans. The rest are Biharis and, and, and people from UP, Avad, who've never seen snow before, and no idea how to fight in the mountains in the middle of thick snowdrifts. It's been a particularly bitter and desperate winter. And among those on the retreat, next slide, uh, these are the guys waiting for them with their long barrel gazelles. These gazelles, the same, the same um, weapons that you see Aurangzeb shooting deer with 200 years earlier, um, 100, 100 years earlier, 150 years earlier. Uh, they're old fashioned, crude, but they fire half a mile, uh, while the British muskets can only fire 300 yards. So they prepare ambushes with these slip trenches halfway up the mountains, the British can't fire back. Among those on the retreat is my great uncle, this rather dressy fellow here in his uh, Afghan kit is Colin Mackenzie, not the Orientalist in South India, but his kinsman um, who describes at 9 a.m. the troops moved off a crouching, drooping, dispirited army so different from the smart, light-hearted body of men they appeared some time ago. The men sinking a foot deep with each step and my heart sunk within me under the conviction that we were a doomed force. I always remember, he writes in his memoirs, one of the most heart-rending sights of that humiliating day, fixing my eyes by chance on a little Hindustani child, sitting perfectly naked in the snow with no mother or father near her. She was a beautiful little girl, about two years old, just strong enough to sit upright with her little legs doubled underneath her, hair curling in waving locks. around her soft little throat and her great black eyes dilated to twice their normal size, fixed on the armed men, the passing cavalry and all the strange sights that met her gaze. Many other children as young as innocent I saw slain on the road and women with their long dark hair wet with their own blood. The rear guard had to fight the whole way to Bagrami and pass through a literally continuous line of poor wretches, men, women and children, dead and dying from colds and wounds, who unable to move entreated their comrades to kill them and put an end to their misery. So the British managed to do the same mistake twice. Having lost all their food and ammunition within the first couple of days of the uprising, they then do it again on the retreat. The cavalry go out first, followed by the infantry, and the baggage comes last. And of course, the Ghazis fall on the baggage and, and seize it, not out of strategy, but simply because they want to plunder the baggage, which they do, and then burn the contumments. So the first of the cavalry arrive at the camping place, and they want, they're off their horses, they're waiting for their bearers to come with their tea in their tent, put up their tent and make a nice bath. No bearers, no tent, no food. Six o'clock, it gets dark, still no sign of the, of the tents or anyone else. By 10 o'clock, it's minus 30 and there's no food and the tents are clearly not going to come. So the Afghans who are with the party know exactly what to do because they know what to do in snow. You, they dig a circle in the snow. This is his He's in charge of the Jezelchis, who are the, the Afghan snipermen with these long-barreled... And, and, and he describes them 
digging a circle in the snow, they light a fire in the middle, and then they sit body to body in a, in a kind of like, like a clock face, um, and with their feet facing in at the fire, and they put all their cloaks and all their turbans, everything, any material that they've got, any textile they've got over the top of them, uh, and that way they've still got all their bits in the morning. It's not a very comfy night, but at minus 30 they're still alive. Unlike the poor old sepoys who just go to sleep in the snow, and many of them don't wake up the following morning. And those that do find that their legs and their extremities, their fingers and their toes, look like charred logs of wood after one night. And they can't move. They're completely paralyzed. They can just crawl on their hands and knees. At this point, Wazir Akbar Khan, who is the great Afghan freedom fighter, who, after whom the main diplomatic area of, of uh, of uh, Kabul is still named, the Chanakya Puri of, uh, of uh, Kabul, uh, comes up, herds them into the Kudkabul Pass where the tribesmen are waiting in ambush. Next slide. Here he is again. Next. Um, Lady Sale is at the front. The confusion was fearful. We had not proceeded half a mile when we were heavily fired upon. The pony my daughter rode was wounded in the ear and the neck. I had only one musket ball in my shoulder. Three others passed through my cloak without doing me any injury. The pass completely choked up, and for a considerable period we were stationary under heavy fire. Many poor wretches died around the tent that night. Many women and children were abducted. So 18,500 men, women and children leave the cantonment on the 6th of January. It's down to about 12,000 by night too. By the time they've been ambushed in the Kod Kabul, there's only about 6,000 left. They then go up the Tezin Pass and get caught in the most enormous blizzard. 1,000 men only come down on night five. Waiting for them at the bottom, the Gilzais have erected a holly hedge uh, and uh, prepared another ambush. And as they try to clamber over the hedge and impale themselves on the thorns of these horrible sights, the cavalry trample the artillery. It's a complete mess. Only 200 people make it over that hedge. Those 200 are exposed the following morning at dawn on the hill of Gundamuk, where they famously form a square and fight to their last bullet and then fight on with their bayonets and they're all slain, except one man, this guy, Thomas Souter, who's wrapped the regimental colours around him and he's taken hostage as he looks posh um, and it might be worth something. Next slide. Fifteen of the cavalry make it on ahead of there to the Nimla Gardens, built by Shah Jahan, at the same time he was building the War Gardens near Islamabad, near Taxila. They're offered must and naan, bread and yogurt, by the uh, Malis. And they get off their horses and they eat their breakfast, then they're clubbed to death by the Malis. <coughs> Next, one man only, literally one man, makes it through to Jalalabad, Dr. Bryden on his horse, out of 18,500 18 men, women and children that left only six days earlier. General Sale, the husband of Lady Sale, rides out <coughs> on his horse and says, where is the army? And Bryden says, I am the army. He's only survived because he's rolled up Blackwood's magazine, which is the kind of granter or the kind of New York Review of books of its day, in his forage cap and with a leather binding. And when they, he has a sl someone slashes him with a talwar and it goes through the leather binding, but it doesn't go through his skull. And he lives to tell the tale. That night they put up lanterns and b blow bugles, but no one comes in. There are no stragglers. A strong wind was blowing from the south, which sent the sound of the bugles all over the town. A terrible wailing sound of those bugles I will never forget. This is Thomas Seaton, a young, a young recruit. It was a dirge for our slaughtered soldiers and heard throughout the night had an inexpressibly mournful and depressing effect. The Afghans are very class and race conscious in their attitude to their captives, of which they now have very large numbers. The British officer class are squirreled away to use as hostages because the British have got Dost Muhammad in Deridun, the, the, the Wazir Akbar Khan's father, plus all his wives, plus a lot of the harem and the, and the wider household are all in captivity in Britain. So they need hostages to get them back. So all the officers and all their wives are kept. A few of the British other ranks are taken in if they look well-dressed and smart. The sepoys who are injured or who are frostbitten, are stripped of their clothes and just driven into the snow. 
the sepoys who are able-bodied are enslaved and they're sold off to the Uzbek slavers. And the Uzbek slavers have a particularly unpleasant method of keeping their hostages, keeping their prisoners obedient. They take a long needle which you use for carpet making and you sew a horsehair rope through the clavicle of your captive and then tie it to the saddle of the horse and your hands are tied behind your back and if you don't keep up with the horseman riding ahead of you your whole chest is ripped open in excruciating agony and 5,000 sepoys are led off in this manner to the slave markets of Bukhara where the price of male slaves drops to the lowest it's ever been such as the glut and it's those who escape such as Subedar Bakh Khan who leave 1857 uh, Several, many hostages, many of them are not taken off Central Asia, many of them are enslaved and just set to work in the farms around Kabul and are eventually freed when the British come back. But they've seen how their officers were led off to the cushy forts where they're given food and drink and sat beside fires to write their diaries and, and complain about their captivity while they are enslaved. And it's those guys who start 1857. It's exactly the regiments which were in Afghanistan which mutiny first in May the 11th at Meerut in the great first war of independence or the Indian mutiny or the great sepoy uprising whatever you want to call it we passed some 200 dead bodies this is lady sale many of them europeans the whole naked covered with large gaping wounds as the day advanced several poor wretches of hindustanis camp followers who'd escaped the massacre of the night before made an appearance from behind rocks and within caves where they'd taken shelter from the murderous lives of the afghans they'd been stripped of all they possessed and few could crawl more than a few yards on their hands and knees, being frostbitten in the feet. Here Johnson found two of his servants. One had his hands and feet frostbitten, had a fearful sword cut and a musket ball in his stomach. The other had his right arm completely cut through to the bone. Both were utterly destitute of covering, stark naked, and had not tasted food in five days. Wounded and starving, they had set fire to the bushes and grass and huddled together to impart warmth to each other. Subsequently, we heard that scarcely any of these poor wretches escaped from this defile, and that driven to extremes of hunger, they sustained life by feeding upon their dead comrades. So scenes of unimaginable horror, but for the Afghans, this is their big victory. Seen from the other side of the telescope, this is what Yorktown and Wellington is to you guys, what Gandhi and the Salt March is to India, what Michael Collins and the Easter Rising is to the Irish, what Nelson and Trafalgar or Waterloo or the Battle of Britain is to the Brits, this is to the Afghans. This is their miraculous survival and defeat of Britain at the very peak of the battle. 1840, when this happens, is, if you look at the economic map, the, literally the peak moment of British economic power. Within 10 years, Germany, the rise of Germany, then America, begins this long decline of British dominance of the world economy. But at this point, the Brits control about 40% of the world economy. They are the superpower, they're incredibly rich, and yet they're defeated, and not just defeated, they're annihilated by this Afghan army using ancient weapons. And for the Afghans, this is miraculous. This is the great deliverance. And in the epic poems which are written, and the point, in a sense, the excuse for writing this book was going to Afghanistan and digging up a huge number of Afghan sources for this war, which still survive. There are two big epic poems, there's the Jang Nama and the Akbar Nama. Akbar Nama, not the, not the Abul Faisal Akbar Nama, but a different one. The Abul Faisal was Yakbar Khan, is an extraordinary book, done, commissioned by the Barak Sais in 1843 as the official record. There is a provincial version of it from uh, called the Jang Name, which tells the point of view for the Kohistanis, where the hero is the, uh, is the Kohistani peers who lead the Kohistanis to victory against the British in Charikar. There is Shah Shuja's autobiography, there's Mirza Atta, there's several uh, volumes of letters of Aminullah Khan Nogari, one of the resistance leaders. There's tons of stuff. Plus, um, there are, there's the whole oral tradition. And I didn't get, in the course of my research, to Peshawar. Um, Peshawar's been a little tricky to get to lately. And I'm sure that if I'd spent a, a week or two there, the Pashtun sources would have been equally rich. 
and there's a future pitch D, I'm sure, for anyone that wants to follow it up. When, um, what was the French guy who did the songs of Afghanistan? Darmister, Darmister? He published two volumes and sent the, a third volume of all the stuff from the first Afghan war, the oral traditions and songs, um, by sea to France, and the, and the thing sunk. And so his volume on the first Afghan war has never appeared. But at the time, clearly, there was millions of songs being sung about this all over Afghanistan, um, of which this body of stuff I found in Kabul is only the, a fraction of, of, of a once very rich oral tradition. But Mirza Atta writes, it's, it is said that 60,000 English troops, half from Bengal, half from other provinces, without counting servants and camp followers, went to Afghanistan, and only a handful came back alive wounded and destitute. The rest fell with neither grave nor shroud to cover them and lay scattered in that land like rotting donkeys. For the English love gold and money and they cannot stop themselves from laying their hands on any area productive of wealth. But what prize did they find in Afghanistan except on one hand the exhausting of their treasury and on the other the disgracing of their army. It is said that 40,000 English troops had been in Kabul Many were taken captive en route. Many remained as cripples or beggars. And the rest perished in the mountains, like a ship sunk without trace. For it is no easy thing to invade and occupy the kingdom of Horasan. But the Brits can't have this. They need to save face. So the following spring, they send in the rather sinisterly entitled Army of Retribution. And it's got their crack general, this guy called Pollock, who's as meticulous as Elphinstone was foolish. He gathers, he waits in Peshawar until he's made sure every single sepoy's got 300 rounds of ammunition, uh, he's got exactly the right number of camels, exactly the mind, mind of, uh, of armament that he needs. He calculates it exactly, he sits there checking his sums. Then he goes in, and when he goes, he burns the crops, cuts down the trees, unroofs every house, destroys every village, and finally, next slide, next, liberates the hostages, next slide, and burns down the Chachata Bazaar, which is built by Ali Mardan Khan in 1640, the, one of the great spectacular buildings of Mughal domestic architecture. Dynamites it, puts Kabul to flames, arson parties are sent all around, and marches out. Dos Mohammed, this picture incidentally is here in San Francisco in the, um, in the Kapani collection at the Asian Art Museum. Uh, Dos Mohammed, when I was last year, with you in February, I went into the museum and saw this on the wall. It's now in the back, the last picture in there. I didn't know about it before. Dost Mohammed is welcomed, uh, is, is freed from captivity in Dehradun, where he's been kept under house arrest. And he meets Ellenborough at the border, and Ellenborough says, if you come and attack us again, or make any arrangements with the Russians, we'll go in and we'll burn your country again. We'll leave you alone if you leave us alone. And Dost Mohammed keeps to that. And in 1857, when the rebels appeal to him to come and um, sweep down through the Punjab, he doesn't. He, st he stops. Dost Mohammed rules Afghanistan for another 20 years. He starts off very weak, as just the ruler of Kabul. He gradually accumulates his strength. He takes Kandahar, the Ghazni, Ghazni, then Kandahar. He then goes north and conquers Qum and Balkh, as far as the Amudarya, as far as the Oxus. And finally, in 1862, takes Herat, completing the conquest of Afghanistan and for the first time creating an Afghanistan that looks like the country on the map today. And by this point, at around this time, you find Afghans beginning to use the phrase Afghanistan for the first time, which up to then had been a, a British invention. Afghans describe themselves as Afghans, but there's very little use of the phrase. Khorasan is the normal phrase, but that actually includes much of Persia, and it's a slightly different conception. It's a geographical conception. Anyway, so Mirza Atta, we'll just give him the last word. These English had hoped to establish themselves in Afghanistan and block any Russian advance. But for all the treasure they expended and for all the lives they sacrificed, the only result was ruin and disgrace. For if the English had been able to take and keep this wonderful country, would they really have left it? This land where 44 different types of grape grow and other fruits as well. Watermelon and muskmelon, peaches and apricots, pomegranates, pears, rhubarb and mulberries. Ah, and ice water that cannot be found in all the plains of India. These Indians know neither how to dress nor how to eat. God save me from the fire of their dal and their miserable chapatis. <laughs> <laughs>
So that's Mia's Atta signing off on Hindustani cuisine. So, as a little envoi, when I was researching this, I thought I couldn't do this without going on the route of the retreat. I couldn't work out how to do it because the back of the retreat, if we go back a few slides to that picture of the, uh, uh, the last stand at Gundamuk, these guys with the, forming the square on the hilltop next, 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 there. The hill behind Gundamuk is Tora Bora, the site of a later last stand. And um, the it's the heart of Taliban territory. Anyway, I had a kind of lucky break that didn't seem like it at the time, and that I got hauled in by the NDS, the, uh, the secret police, on my second afternoon in Kabul. I didn't know what was going on, and I was rather frightened. And I was led into the office of Amrullah Saleh, who was Karzai's intelligence chief. And I then got, well, some, some, it was sort of halfway between an interrogation and a book review. <laughs> he didn't, he had, he'd read Last Mogul, he somehow got his hands on the Last Mogul, didn't like it. Uh, and, I, and he lectured me, <laughs> this man was not a patriot. <laughs> you were too sympathetic to him. But this time he says, you won't make the same mistakes. And, so, and you must know this land properly. You're ignorant of this land, and only if you look around. So he said, you've got to go on the route of the retreat. And he set me up with this warlord. And said, you will do this tomorrow. <laughs> and he brought, this, brought out this character called Amwar Khan Jigdalik, who is this truly scary former champion of the Af I'm not making this up, he's the champ he was the he was the he was captain of the Afghan Olympic wrestling team <laughs> who was um, who was uh, about eighteen foot tall and about thirty five feet wide and he's an extraordinary guy. And he was a former Hezbi Islami Muj commander. And so um, under Amrullah um, Saleh's protection and with the help of this um, warlord we set off the following morning in this line of pickups. All um, all um, uh, and were Kanjik Dalek's merry men with the Kalashnikovs and rocket propelled grenades and things around their heads. It was kind of real sort of central casting, Afghan Moj kind of movie stuff. And we passed the site of the cantonment, which you won't be surprised to hear is exactly on the site of the American Embassy today. Uh, <laughs> and off down the Kabul, up the Tezin Pass, down the Tezin Pass, and we got to Jigdalik, which was where he was from, which is where the Holly Hedge was. And at that point, we, never, we, we were taken aside and given this enormous feast because he was the local hero. They killed a sheep and they grilled it and all the rest of it. And carpets being rolled out in apricot groves and mulberry, mulberry pillow. Caught, and it, so by about four in the afternoon, it was clear we, were getting, we weren't going anywhere. <laughs> and I, like so many other Brits before me, Westerners before me, was defeated uh, in, 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 in Jagdalik and retired and had to retreat back to Jalalabad. Um, and, but arrived in Jalalabad that night, having never made it to Gundamuk, which is the whole point of the trip. Um, to find that we in fact had a very lucky break because that day they'd come and burnt the poppy crop. And the villagers had resisted, they'd shot up the police, at, it was about nine or 10 in the morning, and they'd killed four policemen, captured 90, and blown up five police vehicles uh, in a very carefully executed ambush that morning. So had I turned up merrily burping with Anwar Khan at five in the afternoon, I probably wouldn't be standing before you telling this story now. So the following day, the Elders of Gundamak come into Jalalabad to negotiate, have a joga, because they've got all the hostages. So they have hostage negotiations. And Anwar Khan, who's a local from the next door village from Jigdalik, uh, is brought as the negotiator. And so I sit there as these old guys, these guys with beards, sit there nodding away and, and discussing what they're going to do. And while we're sitting there, all these predator drones are taking off behind, because this is the main predator base, Jalalabad, uh, which is why the Taliban attacked it last year. And um, in kind of Bourne movies, there's always one drone that takes off, and you see some guys in sort of Cape Canaveral or Virginia or wherever they're doing it from, sort of sitting there looking at the, the video. This, these things are like London taxis or, or New York taxi ranks in Jalalabad. There's one after another just taking off and, uh, and buzzing the hills around. They're very sinister looking things. And anyway, they, they all discussed. And at the end of it, Anwar Khan brought the guys over, and we sat drinking tea. And I said, you know, do you. Burns, McNaughton, these names mean anything. And they all knew it. This was all, this stuff which I thought was obscure sort of stuff that only people, people that read Flashman or, or, or read Peter Hopkirk knew about. But um, the, these are common names in, in every Afghan village. Uh, and the defeat of 
Burns McNaughton by uh, uh, Wazir Akbar Khan is common currency in village after village that we pass through. It's exactly the same, said Jacob. <laughs> Both times the foreigners have come here for their own interests, not for ours. They say we are your friends, we want to help, but they're lying. Whoever comes to Afghanistan, even now, they'll face the fate of Burns and McNaughton. We are the roof of the world, said one of the old elders. From here you can control and watch everywhere. Afghanistan is like a crossroads for every nation that comes to power. But we do not have the strength to control our own destiny. Our fate is determined by our neighbours. After the joke was over, two tribal elders came. Uh, and uh, they said, tell me the story. So one last month, some American officers called us to a hotel in Jalalabad for a meeting. One of them asked me, why do you hate us? And I replied, this is the elder speaking, because you blow down our doors, enter our houses, you pull our women by the hair, and you kick our children. We cannot accept this. We will fight back, and we will break your teeth. And when your teeth are broken, you will leave, just as the Russians and the British left before you. What did he say to that, I asked. He turned to his friend and said, if the old men are like this, what will the younger ones be like? <laughs> In truth, all the Americans here know their game is over. It's just their politicians who deny it. This is the last days of the Americans, said the other elder. Next, it will be China. Thank you.